friends, I'm Ellie, welcome to Cardboard Design. Today, let's listen to the meaningful fairy tales that I am about to tell. You will like it. The first fairy tale, The Four Skillful Brothers. There was once a poor man who had four sons, and when they were grown up, he said to them, My dear children, you must now go out into the world, for I have nothing to give you. So set out and go to some distance and learn a trade and see how you can make your way. So the four brothers took their sticks, bade their father farewell, and went through the town gate together. When they had traveled about for some time, they came to a crossway which branched off in four different directions. Then said the eldest, Here we must separate, but on this day four years, we will meet each other again at this spot, and in the meantime we will seek our fortunes. Then each of them went his way, and the eldest met a man who asked him where he was going, and what he was intending to do. I want to learn a trade, he replied. Then the other said, Come with me, and be a thief. No, he answered. That is no longer regarded as a reputable trade, and the end of it is that one has to swing on the gallows. Oh, said the man, you need not be afraid of the gallows. I will only teach you to get such things as no other man could ever lay hold of, and no one will ever detect you. So he allowed himself to be talked into it, and while with the man became an accomplished thief, and so dexterous that nothing was safe from him, if he once desired to have it. The second brother met a man who put the same question to him what he wanted to learn in the world. I don't know yet, he replied. Then come with me and be an astronomer. There is nothing better than that, for nothing is hid from you. He liked the idea, and became such a skillful astronomer that when he had learned everything, and was about to travel onwards, his master gave him a telescope and said to him, With that you canst thou see whatsoever takes place either on earth or in heaven, and nothing can remain concealed from there. A huntsman took the third brother into training, and gave him such excellent instruction in everything which related to huntsmanship that he became an experienced hunter. When he went away, his master gave him a gun and said, It will never fail you. Whatsoever you aim at, you are certain to hit. The youngest brother also met a man who spoke to him and inquired what his intentions were. Would you not like to be a tailor? Said he. Not that I know of, said the youth. Sitting doubled up from morning till night, driving the needle and the goose backwards and forwards is not to my taste. Oh, but you are speaking in ignorance, answered the man. With me you would learn a very different kind of tailoring, which is respectable and proper, and for the most part very honorable. So he let himself be persuaded, and went with the man, and learned his art from the very beginning. When they parted, the man gave the youth a needle, and said, With this you can sew together whatever is given you, whether it is as soft as an egg or as hard as steel, and it will all become one piece of stuff so that no scene will be visible. When the appointed four years were over, the four brothers arrived at the same time at the crossroads, embraced and kissed each other, and returned home to their father. So now, said he, quite delighted. The wind has blown you back again to me, me, me. They told him of all that had happened to them, and that each had learned his own trade. Now they were sitting just in front of the house under a large tree, and the father said, I will put you all to the test, and see what you can do. Then he looked up and said to his second son, Between two branches up at the top of this tree, there is a chaffinch's nest. Tell me how many eggs there are in it. The astronomer took his glass, looked up, and said, There are five. Then the father said to the eldest, Fetch the eggs down without disturbing the bird which is sitting hatching them. The skillful thief climbed up, and took the five eggs from beneath the bird, which never observed what he was doing, and remained quietly sitting where she was, and brought them down to his father. The father took them, and put one of them on each corner of the table, and the fifth in the middle, and said to the huntsman, With one shot thou shalt shoot me the five eggs in two, through the middle. The huntsman aimed, and shot the eggs, all five as the father had desired, and that at one shot. He certainly must have had some of the powder for shooting round corners. Now it's your turn, said the father to the fourth son. You shall sew the eggs together again, 
and the young birds that are inside them as well. And you must do it so that they are not hurt by the shot. The tailor brought his needle and sewed them as his father wished. When he had done this, the thief had to climb up the tree again and carry them to the nest and put them back again under the bird without her being aware of it. The bird sat her full time, and after a few days the young ones crept out, and they had a red line round their necks where they had been sewn together by the tailor. Well, said the old man to his son, I begin to think you are worth more than Breen Clover. You have used your time well, and learned something good. I can't say which of you deserves the most praise. That will be proved if you have but an early opportunity of using your talents. Not long after this, there was a great uproar in the country, for the king's daughter was carried off by a dragon. The king was full of trouble about it both by day and night, and caused it to be proclaimed that whosoever brought her back should have her to wife. The four brothers said to each other, this would be a fine opportunity for us to show what we can do and resolve to go forth together and liberate the king's daughter. I will soon know where she is, said the astronomer and looked through his telescope and said, I see her already. She is far away from here on a rock in the sea and the dragon is beside her watching her. Then he went to the king and asked for a ship for himself and his brothers and sailed with them over the sea until they came to the rock. There the king's daughter was sitting, and the dragon was lying asleep on her lap. The huntsman said, I dare not fire. I should kill the beautiful maiden at the same time. Then I will try my art, said the thief, and he crept thither and stole her away from under the dragon, so quietly and dexterously, that the monster never remarked it, but went on snoring. Full of joy, they hurried off with her on board ship, and steered out into the open sea, but the dragon, who when he awoke had found no princess there, followed them, and came snorting angrily through the air. Just as he was circling above the ship, and about to descend on it, the huntsman shouldered his gun, and shot him to the heart. The monster fell down dead, but was so large and powerful that his fall shattered the whole ship. Fortunately, however, they laid hold of a couple of planks, and swam about the wide sea. Then again they were in great peril, but the tailor, who was not idle, took his wondrous needle and with a few stitches sewed the planks together, and they seated themselves upon them, and collected together all the fragments of the vessel. Then he sewed these so skillfully together, that in a very short time the ship was once more seaworthy, and they could go home again in safety. When the king once more saw his daughter, there were great rejoicings. He said to the four brothers, one of you shall have her to wife, but which of you it is to be you must settle among yourselves. Then a warm contest arose among them, for each of them preferred his own claim. The astronomer said, If I had not seen the princess, all your arts would have been useless, so she is mine. The thief said, What would have been the use of your scene, if I had not got her away from the dragon? So she is mine. The huntsman said, you and the princess, and all of you, would have been torn to pieces by the dragon if my ball had not hit him, so she is mine. The tailor said, And if I, by my art, had not sewn the ship together again, you would all of you have been miserably drowned, so she is mine. Then the king uttered the same. Each of you has an equal right, and as all of you cannot have the maiden, none of you shall have her. But I will give to each of you, as a reward, half a kingdom. The brothers were pleased with this decision, and said, It is better thus than that we should be at variance with each other. Then each of them received half a kingdom, and they lived with their father in the greatest happiness as long as it pleased God. The story encourages the importance of learning a trade and making the most of one's time meaningfully. The four brothers chose to learn different trades and applied this knowledge to help others and rescue the princess. This emphasizes the value of learning a trade to serve the community. The brothers demonstrated artistry and creativity in problem solving. By using their individual skills, they overcame challenges and successfully completed the mission of rescuing the princess. This highlights the significance of creativity in problem solving. The story is a testament to collaboration and sharing. The four brothers, each with unique skills, work together to achieve a common goal. 
Collaboration and sharing not only helped them succeed in the task of saving the princess, but also brought happiness and prosperity to each individual in the family. The Second Fairy Tale The Devil and His Grandmother There was a great war, and the king had many soldiers, but gave them small pay, so small that they could not live upon it, so three of them agreed among themselves to desert. One of them said to the others, if we are caught, we shall be hanged on the gallows. How shall we manage it? Another said, Look at that great cornfield. If we were to hide ourselves there, no one could find us. The troops are not allowed to enter it, and tomorrow they are to march away. They crept into the corn. Only the troops did not march away, but remained lying all round about it. They stayed in the corn for two days and two nights, and were so hungry that they all but died. But if they had come out, their death would have been certain. Then said they, What is the use of our deserting if we have to perish miserably here? But now a fiery dragon came flying through the air, and it came down to them, and asked why they had concealed themselves there. They answered, We are three soldiers who have deserted because the pay was so bad, and now we shall have to die of hunger if we stay here, or to dangle on the gallows if we go out. If you will serve me for seven years, said the dragon, I will convey you through the army so that no one shall seize you. We have no choice and are compelled to accept. They replied. Then the dragon caught hold of them with his claws and carried them away through the air over the army and put them down again on the earth far from it. But the dragon was no other than the devil. He gave them a small whip and said, Whip with it and crack it. And then as much gold will spring up round about as you can wish for. Then you can live like great lords, keep wow. horses, and drive your carriages. But when the seven years have come to an end, you are my property. Then he put before them a book which they were all three forced to sign. I will, however, then set you a riddle, said he. And if you can guess that, you shall be free and released from my power. Then the dragon flew away from them, and they went away with their whip, had gold in plenty, ordered themselves rich apparel, and traveled about the world. Wherever they were they lived in pleasure and magnificence, rode on horseback, drove in carriages, ate and drank, but did nothing wicked. The time slipped quickly away, and when the seven years were coming to an end, two of them were terribly anxious and alarmed, but the third took the affair easily, and said, Brothers, fear nothing, my head is sharp enough. I shall guess the riddle. They went out into the open country and sat down, and the two pulled sorrowful faces. Then an aged woman came up to them who inquired why they were so sad. Alas, said they, how can that concern you? After all, you cannot help us. Who knows, said she, confide your trouble to me. So they told her that they had been the devil's servants for nearly seven years and that he had provided them with gold as plentifully as if it had been blackberries, but that they had sold themselves to him, and were forfeited to him, if at the end of the seven years they could not guess a riddle. The old woman said, If you are to be saved, one of you must go into the forest. There he will come to a fallen rock which looks like a little house. He must enter that, and then he will obtain help. The two melancholy ones thought to themselves, that will still not save us. And stayed where they were, but the third, the merry one, got up and walked on in the forest until he found the rock house. In the little house, however, a very aged woman was sitting, who was the devil's grandmother, and asked the soldier where he came from and what he wanted there. He told her everything that had happened, and as he pleased her well, she had pity on him and said she would help him. She lifted up a great stone which lay above a cellar and said, Conceal thyself there, thou canst hear everything that is said here. Only sit still, and do not stir. When the dragon comes, I will question him about the riddle. He tells everything to me, so listen carefully to his answer. At twelve o'clock at night, the dragon came flying thither and asked for his dinner. The grandmother laid the table, and served up food and drink, so that he was pleased, and they ate and drank together. In the course of conversation, she asked him what kind of a day he had had and how many souls he had got. Nothing went very well today. He answered. But I have laid hold of three soldiers. I have them safe. 
Indeed! Three soldiers said something like, but they may escape you yet. The devil said mockingly, They are mine! I will set them a riddle, which they will <laughs> never in this world be able to guess. What riddle is that? She inquired. I will tell you. In the great north sea lies a dead dogfish that shall be your roast meat, and the rib of a whale shall be your silver spoon, and a hollow old horse's hoof shall be your wine glass. When the devil had gone to bed, the old grandmother raised up the stone and let out the soldier. Hast thou paid particular attention to everything? Yes, said he. I know enough and will contrive to save myself. Then he had to go back another way, through the window, secretly and with all speed to his companions. He told them how the devil had been overreached by the old grandmother, and how he had learned the answer to the riddle from him. Then they were all joyous and of good cheer, and took the whip and whipped so much gold for themselves that it ran all over the ground. When the seven years had fully gone by, the devil came with the book, showed the signatures, and said, I will take you with me to hell. There you shall have a meal. If you can guess what kind of roast meat you will have to eat, you shall be free and released from your bargain, and may keep the whip as well. Then the first soldier began and said, In the great north sea lies a dead dog. Fish that no doubt is the roast meat. The devil was angry, and asked the second, But what will your spoon be? The rib of a whale, that is to be our silver spoon. The devil made a right face, again growled, and said to the third, And do you also know what your wine glass is to be? An old horse's hoof is to be our wine glass. Then the devil flew away with a loud cry, and had no more power over them, but the three kept the whip, whipped as much money for themselves with it as they wanted, and lived happily to their end. The story emphasizes the importance of mastering problem-solving skills, Instead of surrendering to difficulties, the soldiers found a clever way to resolve their challenging situation and achieve their goals. The principle in the story is not to accept unfair agreements. The third soldier dared to confront difficulties and sought a fair solution, refusing to accept anything undeserved from the demon. The story serves as evidence of the significance of intelligence and compassion in overcoming malevolence. Through the cleverness of the old woman and the compassion of the third soldier, they were able to overcome the challenge and live happily without succumbing to the malevolence of the demon. Third Fairy Tale The Three Apprentices There were once three apprentices who had agreed to keep always together while traveling and always to work in the same town. At one time, however, their masters had no more work to give them so that at last they were in rags and had nothing to live on. Then one of them said, What shall we do? We cannot stay here any longer. We will travel once more. And if we do not find any work in the town we go to, we will arrange with the innkeeper there that we are to write and tell him where we are staying so that we can always have news of each other and then we will separate. Merry and that Christmas! seemed best to the others also. They went forth and met on the way a richly dressed man who asked who they were. We are apprentices looking for work. Up to this time we have kept together but if we cannot find anything to do, we are going to separate. There is no need for that, said the man. If you will do what I tell you, you shall not want for gold or for work. Nay, you shall become great lords and drive in your carriages. One of them said, If our souls and salvation be not endangered, we will certainly do it. They will not, replied the man. I have no claim on you. One of the others had, however, looked at his feet, and when he saw a horse's foot and a man's foot, he did not want to have anything to do with him. The devil, however, said, Be easy, I have no designs on you, but on another soul, which is half my own already, and whose measure shall but run full. As they were now secure, they consented, and the devil told them what he wanted. The first was to answer. <laughs> All three of us, to every question, the second was to say, for money, and the third, and quite right, too. They were always to say this, one after the other, but they were not to say one word more, 
and if they disobeyed this order, all their money would disappear at once. But so long as they observed it, their pockets would always be full. As a beginning, he at once gave them as much as they could carry and told them to go to such and such an inn when they got to the town. They went to it, and the innkeeper came to meet them and asked if they wished for anything to eat. The first replied, All three of us? Yes! said the host. That is what I mean! The second said, For money! Of course! said the host. The third said, And quite right too! Certainly it is right! said the host. Good meat and drink were now brought to them, and they were well waited on. After the dinner came the payment, and the innkeeper gave the bill to the one who said, All three of us? The second said, For money! And the third, And quite right too! Indeed it is right! said the host. All three pay, and without money I can give nothing. They, however, paid still more than he had asked. The lodgers, who were looking on, said, These people must be mad. Yes, indeed they are, said the host. They are not very wise. So they stayed some time in the inn, and said nothing else but, All three of us, for money. And, and quite right too. But they saw and knew all that was going on. It so happened that a great merchant came with a large sum of money and said, Sir host, take care of my money for me. Here are three crazy apprentices who might steal it from me. The host did as he was asked. As he was carrying the trunk into his room, he felt that it was heavy with gold. Thereupon he gave the three apprentices a lodging below, but the merchant came upstairs into a separate apartment. When it was midnight and the host thought that all were asleep, he came with his wife and they had an axe and struck the rich merchant dead, and after they had murdered him they went to bed again. When it was day there was a great outcry. The merchant lay dead in bed bathed in blood. All the guests ran at once but the host said, The three crazy apprentices have done this. The lodgers confirmed it and said, It can have been no one else. The innkeeper, however, had them called and said to them, Have you killed the merchant? All three of us said the first for money said the second and the third added and quite right too there now you hear said the host they confess it themselves they were taken to prison therefore and were to be tried when they saw that things were going so seriously they were after all afraid but at night the devil came and said bear it just one day longer and do not play away your luck not one hair of your head shall be hurt the next morning they were led to the bar, and the judge said, Are you the murderers? All three of us. Why did you kill the merchant? For money. You wicked wretches, you have no horror of your sins. And quite right too. They have confessed and are still stubborn, said the judge. Lead them to death instantly. So they were taken out, and the host had to go with them into the circle. When they were taken hold of by the executioner's men, and were just going to be led up to the scaffold where the headsman was standing with naked sword, a coach drawn by four blood-red chestnut horses came up suddenly, driving so fast that fire flashed from the stone. And someone made signs from the window with a white handkerchief. Then said the headsman, It is a pardon coming. And, Pardon, pardon, was called from the carriage also. Then the devil stepped out as a very noble gentleman, beautifully dressed, and said, You three are innocent. You may now speak. Make known what you have seen and heard. Then said the eldest, We did not kill the merchant. The murderer is standing there in the circle. And he pointed to the innkeeper. In proof of this, go into his cellar, where many others whom he has killed are still hanging. Then the judge sent the executioner's men thither, and they found it was as the apprentices said. And when they had informed the judge of this, he caused the innkeeper to be led up, and his head was cut off. Then said the devil to the three, Now I have got the soul which I wanted to have, and you are free, and have money for the rest of your life. In times of difficulty, unity and cooperation can make a significant difference. The three apprentice assistants faced challenges together, and their unity helped them navigate through tough times. The story warns about the allure of easy solutions. When the three assistants faced hardship, they were tempted by a mysterious man with an offer that seemed too good to be true. It emphasizes the importance of maintaining moral integrity, even in the face of false accusations.
sticking to the truth is crucial. The three assistants were falsely accused of murder, but they stood by the truth. Eventually, the truth was revealed, and they were exonerated. Fourth Fairy Tale The Lazy Spinner In a certain village there once lived a man and his wife, and the wife was so idle that she would never work at anything, whatever her husband gave her to spin. She did not get done, and what she did spin she did not win, but let it all remain entangled in a heap. If the man scolded her, she was always ready with her tongue and said, Well, how should I win it when I have no reel? Just you go into the forest and get me one. If that is all, said the man, then I will go into the forest and get some wood for making reels. Then the woman was afraid that if he had the wood he would make her a reel of it, and she would have to wind her yarn off, and then begin to spin again. She bet that herself a little, and then a lucky idea occurred to her and she secretly followed the man into the forest, and when he had climbed into a tree to choose and cut the wood, she crept into the thicket below where he could not see her and cried, He who cuts wood for real shall die, and he who wins shall perish. The man listened, laid down his axe for a moment, and began to consider what that could mean. Hello, he said at last. What can that have been? My ears must have been singing. I won't alarm myself for nothing. So he again seized the axe and began to hew. Then again there came a cry from below. He who cuts wood for real shall die, and he who wins shall perish. He stopped and felt afraid and alarmed and pondered over the circumstance. But when a few moments had passed, he took heart again, and a third time he stretched out his hand for the axe and began to cut. But someone called out a third time and said loudly, he who cuts wood for real shall die, and he who wins shall perish. That was enough for him, and all inclination had departed from him. So he hastily descended the tree and set out on his way home. The woman ran as fast as she could by byways so as to get home first. So when he entered the parlor, she put on an innocent look as if nothing had happened and said, Well, have you brought a nice piece of wood for reals? No, said he. I see very well that winding won't do. And told her what had happened to him in the forest, and from that time forth left her in peace about it. Nevertheless, after some time, the man again began to complain of the disorder in the house. Wife, said he, It is really a shame that this spun yarn should lie there all entangled. I'll tell you what, said she, As we still don't come by any real go you up into the loft, and I will stand down below, and will throw the yarn up to you, and you will throw it down to me, and so we shall get a skein after all. Yes, that will do, said the man. So they did that, and when it was done, he said, The yarn is in skeins, now it must be boiled. The woman was again distressed. She certainly said, Yes, we will boil it next morning early. But she was secretly contriving another trick. Early in the morning she got up, lighted a fire, and put the kettle on, only instead of the yarn, she put in a lump of tow and let it boil. After that she went to the man who was still lying in bed, and said to him, I must just go out, you must get up and look after the yarn which is in the kettle on the fire, but you must be at hand at once, mind that, for if the cock should happen to crow, and you are not attending to the yarn, it will become tow. The man was willing and took good care not to loiter. He got up as quickly as he could and went into the kitchen. But when he reached the kettle and peeped in, he saw, to his horror, nothing but a lump of tow. Then the poor man was as still as a mouse, thinking he had neglected it and was to blame, and in future said no more about yarn and spinning. But you yourself must own she was an odious woman, the story emphasizes that laziness can lead to negative consequences. The lazy couple not only faces difficulties in their daily lives but also encounters challenging situations created by their own laziness. The story demonstrates a creative mindset in facing challenges. Finding a unique solution to make a spindle using the house beam and throwing the thread down is a creative approach to problem solving. Every individual is responsible for their own life. Laziness is not just an individual problem. It affects everyone around. Accepting personal responsibility is crucial to creating a positive environment.
The story ends here. I will come back tomorrow. See you again. Bye-bye.